What's up hobby friends? My name is Casey and welcome to another miniature rescue. Today, we're gonna take a look at an old fine cast model and turn it into something usable in a game right now. One of my favorite things to do in this hobby is to find old, broken models that have been sitting around for years. Something that's broken, or lost some use in whatever the gaming meta was at the time. You never know what kind of treasure is hiding in someone's attic or basement, and it's only a matter of time until they find those old models and decide to put them up for sale on eBay. I was shopping around on eBay and I happened to come across an old and broken Bellacore model for Warhammer 40,000 and Age of Sigmar. Bellacore is an older model, coming in a metal version or fine cast resin. This particular model happens to be the fine cast version, which I'm never too excited to get as there are almost always more problems in the actual casting of the model and not so much of the obvious fixable broken pieces. But the pictures looked all right and more importantly, the price. I picked this guy up for 40 bucks. He's a little thick and hairy with a broken sword, but overall not too bad looking. With a little bit of work, we can have this guy back on the table by the weekend. Speaking of back on the table, this brings up something that I get asked quite a lot. Why do I bother saving older models when there are newer, better versions of them on the market? Here are two very good reasons why. The new models, while often being a lot larger and a lot nicer looking, are always way more expensive. Buying the old model on eBay gives you the gameplay experience with that model while saving a ton of money. And yes, you can play with the old model, which brings me to the second point. Yes, you can play with the old model. The only restriction that I am aware of is base size. So put the old model on the proper size base and you can drop it right into a game. After all, nobody can say that that model isn't that model when it's clearly that model. Yeah. The old Bellacord does have a bit of a size difference compared to its newer counterpart. In this case, he's on a 50 millimeter base and sized fairly for that base. The new model is a bit larger and sits on a 100 millimeter base, so twice the size. This really gives you room to play around. The newer models often have inches on their older selves, so raising them up on the battlefield never really hurts. Just don't go too high or you'll get caught out in 40K or kill team and be seen from a mile away behind any and all cover. Try not to overdo that one. The other option is to create a narrative driven piece almost like a diorama, something that gives the smaller model a nice scene to sit in and still look impressive on the table. We are starting to see more multi-based and diorama-like models these days, which means a more purposeful base with single or multiple smaller models isn't going to look out of place. Before we make that decision though, we need to figure out what we're gonna do with this model. The paint needs to be stripped off and that sword needs some work. So we'll start with a bath in the sonic cleaner and strip that paint off. Once the model is clean, we can begin to talk about that sword. Luckily, it's broken off just above the hilt, which means that this is as simple as finding a sword that's long enough and thick enough to take the place of the one that came with him. There are always multiple options when replacing parts on used models. The easiest thing to do is to find spare parts from an old kit or something in your bits box that might work. The other option is 3D printing. Now, I know not everyone has a 3D printer, but I bet you probably know someone who does, or even someone who knows someone. You get my point. They are becoming more and more available, and for me, even more important to the hobby than ever before. Computer, turn on the Elegoo Saturn. Okay. Recently, the company Elegoo was kind enough to send me their new Saturn to try out. No obligation to do a video, no money exchange, just an honest opinion of their product. 
So I'll be using this printer for a few things in today's video and then let you know how I feel about the printer. Ironically, we won't be using it to print the sword, although originally that was my plan. But I remembered that in the large bag of bits that I keep in my top drawer, there are multiple parts from older GW kits that should fit this guy perfectly. And what do you know? There's an absolute perfectly gigantic demon sword for our friend right in here. Now that we have that selection made, I can cut off the excess bit of sword from his hand, cut the bottom off of the new one, and glue them together. As far as something to 3D print, we will be looking for and printing a super nice base. Remember earlier we checked out the newer Bellicor model and he sits on a pretty sweet 100mm base. So we'll need to find a 100mm round base that fits this theme. First place I check is my mini factory. They usually have something that will work and the files are generally in a very good price range. There's also the possibility that I already have something that will work too, so I need to look at my file collection to see if anything stands out. Of course it then occurred to me that not too long ago I made a pretty huge series of videos on rescuing a large demon of corn army, and I printed out a ton of resin bases for that army. A little search, and there you go. Perfect cracked earth demon bases that I already purchased. Let me load this into the slicing software and get this thing ready to print. One of the main reasons that I landed on these bases, and this 100 millimeter one in particular, is the immediate story that it tells. Or at least the story that you can tell if you want to. We could paint this base like a dry desert with some cracks in it, or we can go heavy on color, or create something that gives off light through cracks in the ground. There are elements of story that can be told if we want to tell them, and there's nothing better for a small model like this than have a bit of storytelling built in to give it more gravitas. Like I was saying earlier, we want something to figuratively elevate this model and have it stand out on the table as much as the newer kit would. So using this base, we're gonna try and do just that. Now that we stripped the model, fixed the sword, and printed out a base, it's time to decide what this guy's gonna look like. Let's head to Instagram and see what the community has been doing with Bellicor lately. Hopefully we can find some of the older ones as well. The first thing we're gonna do is head to Instagram and search for the hashtag Bellicor. This is gonna bring up all the old and the new models, and since the new model is pretty popular right now, we're probably gonna get a majority of those. But that's okay because we're really looking for kind of theme and color and just ways to tell that story like I was saying. So let's look through some of these and find some cool stuff. The first thing that really jumps out to me in a few of these are the purple and gray colors for the skin. I really like how neutral that is, but kind of how deep it is at the same time. It has a really cool look to it. Here's our first older Bellicor model, and this is kind of the same thing. It's got that purple and the gray. I'm really yeah, I think this is definitely going to be the direction that we're going to want to go. I like the idea of having that really light skin with purple shadows. The other thing that really stands out among most of the models in here is that there's some type of OSL effect, whether it's from this sweet flaming sword that we don't actually have on ours, or from the fire down below. And I really like the way that that could look, especially with the base and some other things that we're probably going to be doing. Here's another really good example of that gray and purple. So I think we're probably set on this type of color. And luckily this is actually a picture of the older model, which is really cool. Obviously for multiple reasons, this really stands out. But again, that OSL from below, that fire with our base is gonna be a really good focal point. And I think that's gonna help our smaller, older Bellicor really stand out. For now, I want to scroll down a little bit more and see if we can find more of the older versions of the model. I want to see kind of historically how people have gone with this. It's probably going to be a little more difficult to find, but I'm sure we'll get there. This is a perfect example of what I'm thinking with the base. This kind of fire from down below and, you know, this isn't the same kind of color as a base for the, the actual model, but the idea is there. How that, that color just comes right up underneath and just 
lights everything up. And I think it's perfect. I mean, this is the proper size base for this model, a 50 millimeter base. But since we're working with the 100 millimeter model, we're gonna be taking that and focusing it into the center. And I think that's really gonna do a lot of work. That is a fantastic looking Bellicor. Man, there's just so many good models on here. I, I don't really want to stop, but maybe we'll find one more good one and, and go from there. Should be good. All right, and here is another older version. Again, with the gray skin, so I think I'm definitely locked in on something like that. Um, this is also on a square base, which is kind of nice to see. It's kind of in its original form for Warhammer Fantasy with the Slaves to Darkness army right behind it. I really like this. This is nice. So yeah, I think we have some really cool ideas and I think so far from what I've seen, all of the things that kind of I've talked about with the the underlighting and the purple and the grays and, and that kind of a, a theme haven't really been all pulled together. So I think we can kind of take from a lot of different ideas and put something original together that should be really cool. So why don't we go do that? I really do love going through specific hashtags and seeing how different people paint their models. It's pretty incredible the amount of variety and skill that there is out there. I think we have a good enough idea of where we want to take this model. Let's head to the painting table and get to work. Now that everything is primed, I'll start with the base. The overwhelming thought that I have after looking through Instagram is to do some really nice, not too over the top glow coming from the ground. This will really create some drama for the model and make the size of the base less of an issue, particularly because it will be nice to look at, but also because we'll be focusing our light source at the center of the base. So it shouldn't look too out of place on the table. To accomplish this, I want to lay some darker red into all of the cracks, not worrying too much about the overspray, and then bring in a lighter red into the center. Even after a few coats, I thought it would be nice to bring the heat up a little bit more, so I tried a little orange with not much success. Eventually, I came in with pure white, followed by the same bright red. The white helps to really reflect the light of the color on top of it, and punches up the brightness by quite a good amount. The result is a nice bright point in the middle of the base. After the red is complete, I dry brush the top layer of the base to bring out the texture and blend the crust in with the glow. I am planning on using a lot of whites and grays for Bellicor's skin, so I want the base to be a little bit darker. And with that glow in between the cracks, it really helps to have the ground above it just a little bit darker. We might as well paint the base room black now and set the base aside for later. Next up, I went over the inner wings, eyes, and mouth with a little bit of red paint. I had an idea that this might look interesting after coming in with some skin tone, but it didn't really do what I was hoping. You'll see what I mean after we get there. In order to set up the type of skin tone that I want, I'll be laying down some purple tones in the shadows. I started with a pretty dark purple and covered most of the body from all angles. Then from pretty much perpendicular to the body, I'll throw in some lighter purple so there's a little bit of a transition from the front of the muscles down into the shadows. And finally from above, I want to shoot a nice light gray. This will blend over those layers and give us a really quick highlight on the body. This is usually my go-to for monster skin and I think it works really well. You get a nice deep shadow with a good transition. It looks more natural like this and you can get really far really fast. This is where that bit with the red kind of comes in as well. I put the red into a bunch of areas that I thought might look nice with a glow later on. The eyes in particular were filled in. Then I came back in with some white to go in the centers of the eyes. While putting that top layer of gray, it covers most of that color, but it leaves a little bit of that red behind. And since we have white glowing eyes, they really pop out now because the shadow over the brow looks more realistic. Sure, you could just do this after the fact, but I'm letting the airbrush do some of that cleanup from the brushwork. The blend is more subtle and natural this way, and I didn't have to fuss with blending anything together with a paintbrush. This is all accentuated even more when I come in with that pure white ink. This is a pretty light coat, just in the areas that I want to feature the most. So right in the middle of the forehead, on the top of the arm nearest the face, and just down the front of the body. This brings that light directly into the center of the model and to the face. It really creates a focal point. With all of that, we are done with the airbrush for now. So it's time to bring out the teeny tiny brushes and begin to bring in some details. The first thing I'm gonna do is set up my wet palette and get some of the colors that I've already used through the airbrush down and ready to go. There are a bunch of chains and chain mail on this guy, so I'm gonna fill that in with some dark steel. There are also a couple of leather straps that get a nice dark brown base coat. The white and gray are used to highlight the uppermost areas where the white was put on. 
On the muscles, I layer in a little bit of that color and try to mix the white into it more and more towards the top. Then using pure white, I try to separate the details on each volume. On some areas, there are veins that get painted in, and other areas like the horns, little bits of texture to give them some shape. In order to separate the wings, I glaze in some of that red tone, this time trying to keep it thin and smooth towards the insides and bottom of the wings. I like that my Bellicor is pretty subtle in color right now. The gray works for me, and so far there is a good amount of contrast for me to see what's going on on the model. The red will add a little more and help sell that fiery glow later on. Coming back to the metallics, since I used a pretty dark steel, I'll highlight with the brightest metal that I've got and lightly overbrush all of it. Almost like dry brushing, I just want to hit the most raised details of the metallics. This is a great way to get a dynamic look to your metallics and you don't even need to bring in a wash. Now I think it's time to take care of that giant sword. Of course, everything is in the way, so I'm going to use an old glove to mask off the rest of the model. This is great because it's easy enough to get the glove into tight spaces and make sure we don't overspray onto any part of the model. It took me a little bit to decide what color the sword should be, but I eventually landed on a nice greenish blue to contrast the other colors. So I use white ink to highlight the tip and hilt of the sword on one side and the middle of the sword on the other side, kind of like an old power sword pattern. Let that dry for a minute and then bring in some athermatic blue contrast through the airbrush to tint the entire thing. From here, it's all about going over each item with yet another highlight, taking my time to pick out as many details as I can and bringing them to the forefront of the paint job. Not only is this the most time consuming part of the process, but the part that makes the most difference. Adding in an extra layer of brightness, creating more contrast with a dark separating line, or edge highlighting the sword to give that filter color some extra clarity. All of these things just add to the model. More than anything with the airbrush, it's these little details that make the model sing and get that story across. The last thing to do in order to finish off this story is to lay down some of that red into the shadows. I don't want to go too heavy with this color. After all, there's a lot of work done prior to this in order to get the model to look halfway decent. So I'll thin this red down quite a bit and take my time placing it directly from below. This will mix with the other colors, preserve any of our brush strokes, and give us that subtle glow from below that we're looking for. Before we get to the reveal of the model, I do want to mention a few things. First, this model will be going back up on eBay. As much as I truly enjoy the outcome, I actually don't really have any good use for this guy. And rather than having him sit on my shelf waiting for me to build an army for him, I'd rather see him in a good home and on a table. As always, the auction will start at the same price that I paid for this model, which is 40 bucks. I also wanted to say thank you to everyone who supports this channel, whether you're a subscriber or a patron. Thank you for stopping by, and if you aren't either of those, then please consider joining in on the fun. Second, my final thoughts on that 3D printer. Okay, here we go. I liked it. It printed the base like a champ in crispy 4K details. The actual printer is made pretty well and feels sturdy with lots of metal parts. And finally, the print plate is huge, and I love that for larger print runs and models. It's very comparable to the Anycubic Mono X, which I also own, and in some ways slightly nicer. Overall, not a bad printer at all, and one that I would recommend if you're looking for a large plate mono 4K printer. And with that, thank you Elegoo for sending me the printer. Did we make it? Did we do it? I think so. I very much enjoyed this model. Even though he's on the smaller side, the way that we brought him back to life will make him stand out on a modern table and earn him his place next to the new plastic counterpart. Telling a story with a model can reward you with a richer tabletop experience, as well as bring your old models out of retirement. So start thinking about that. This particular model will still be able to bring the pain down on the table and look awesome at the same time. Thank you again for joining me on another Miniature Rescue. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing as it really helps out the channel. Once again, I'm Casey, and I will see you in the next video. And finally, here, is the completed Bellicor.